all so much for joining on this Friday morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where you're based. Uh, we are so excited to have um, such an amazing panel uh, for this dad's chat, as I'm calling it, uh, Real Talk with Dads, to talk about the mental health side of becoming a parent and what that looks like and feels like uh, when you're a dad. So I'm Mel, I am the co-founder and COO of Mirza. We are a company on a mission to close the gender pay gap um, by ending the motherhood penalty. And we do that through providing uh, financial planning tools for parents. So we can talk a little bit more about that later, but first, um, you know, I'm just actually gonna skip right to uh, why we're all here today to talk to our four amazing panelists. Um, and let's do some quick intros. So Kevin, do you wanna kick us off and just tell us your name, who you are, and um, tell us about your kids, how many kids you have. Sure, um, so my name is Kevin Gruenberg. I'm a psychologist in Los Angeles and I'm, I'm the founder and uh, director of an organization called Love Dad. And we're focused on um, <clears throat> integrating fathers into perinatal and early childhood mental health services and home visiting. In the UK, you call that health visitors. Or, um, but, uh, and so I have, um, I have two kids. I have a 13 year old and a seven year old. I'm both daughters. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, Brian, why don't you go next? Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, I am a dad here in the Chicago area. And last month I went full time as the co-founder and executive director of Fathering Together, which is an organization kind of grew out of a Facebook community, but our focuses are really helping dads be active and engaged in their daughters and sons lives children's lives and mainly doing that virtually by providing support through zoom and, and virtual communities like facebook other social media channels and i've got two very spirited daughters they're four and seven they may make an appearance even though i told them that i was on this so we may have some guest panelists at some point too <laughs> can't wait to have them um steve how about you yeah, hi, I'm uh, Steve DiPianco, uh, co-founder and CEO of Dad Ventures, uh, based in uh, Pasadena, California. Uh, at Dad Ventures, we help dads and their families uh, connect with creators to do uh, really fun entertainment experiences in person and online. Um, I'm a father of three children, uh, 10 and soon to be nine-year-old uh, girl. Uh, two girls, and then a uh, four and a half year old boy um, who really loves dinosaurs. Nice. Um, and Corden, how about you? Absolutely. So my name is Corden Havron. I'm the founder of Corden James and the Comeback Kids. And so with my program, we work on mentoring. We call it the, where Comeback Kids Come Back Stronger. Um, some of the things that we do uh, working on mentorship program and partner with our program called Why Try, which we teach social emotional learning, learning skills to youth, uh, prisoners, juveniles, and so forth. Um, I am a father of three children. I have two boys and a girl. My boys are 13 and 12. And then my daughter is seven. And I think that's it. Amazing. Thank you all so much. A lot of girl dads, which I really enjoy. Um, and yeah, this is going to be such a good talk. Before we kind of kick off with questions just for our audience, please feel free to submit questions in the Q&A um, throughout. And I'll, I'll start us off with some questions that we've already kind of got or have written down, and then we'll open it up to audience questions about halfway through. So please feel free to submit those whenever you have them. All right. So like I said, we're here to talk about uh, the mental health side of becoming a parent, um, especially for dads. I think we hear, you know, a lot about the pre and postnatal depression and, and kind of impacts for, for women. But I would love to kind of hear about your own personal experiences with becoming a new dad and what, what you, you know, kind of the, the highs and lows of what that was like for you. Um, and we can kind of kick off in the same order, if that works, Kevin. Okay. Um, well, so my uh, 13 year old is my stepdaughter. So we met when she was two. Um, so I sort of jumped into fatherhood in a somewhat uh, unique way. And then, um, and then had my, um, my daughter Inez uh, seven years ago. And so that, that was more of, I, I went through the, the process of, um, of pregnancy and, and really new, new fatherhood. Um, one of the things that 
I, I thought about during that time was just how intense and evocative becoming a father was or is um, way, much more than I even had um, anticipated. So I was at that time in my training as a clinical psychologist and I did a lot of work with children. And what I noticed is that almost never in my training and never in my experience as a clinician was were fathers really a part of the work. And I was thinking about how, um, how much I, I was changing as becoming a father. You know? And so um, that kind of kicked off my work actually with dads. Um, but also um, I think on the mental health side of things, I don't think I had paternal depression or anxiety and kind of clinical depression, but um, I've definitely experienced um, just how evocative being a parent is and how, like I definitely, my highest highs and lowest lows are as a father. Um, in moments of feeling like I just have lost my cool or really not really knowing how to, um, how to support my kids, even though like, you know, probably more than 99.9% .9 of the world as a clinical psychologist working with children, I know about what the best thing to do is and just how rarely I'm capable of doing that, you know, sort of pathetic, you know, <laughs> but you could see even just how like, you know, you could feel about these things like as, as a dad, you know, you're falling short or, um, so that's something that I feel a lot, you know, I felt that today actually um, with my 13 year olds where I just, you know, lost it, you know, um, 13 year old, are just complete pains in the ass. So that's also part of it. But um, I, I think I'll let someone else continue. I don't want to, <laughs> but I think you're clear that it's messy. I, I was a 13 year old girl once and I can confirm that we are pretty horrible. <laughs> um, I saw a lot of nods there. So um, yeah, anyone feel free to just kind of jump in and build off that. I, I mean, thanks for the warning. For first off, Kevin, for, for six days from now. Um, but even at seven, I mean, just riding our bikes home from school pickups today, you know, kids, you know, choose to flex their leadership skills at any given moment. And and I don't want to be authoritarian, but when you're in a busy street, you kind of have to be for safety reasons, right? And there's just, um, but it's, it's compounded from the fact that we're tired all the time and there's stressors and things. But um, similar to what Kevin said, a lot of my work got started because when my wife was pregnant, people would find out and they would, and everybody was asking about her and her health, which you need to do, but no one was asking me about how was I preparing to be a father? Like there weren't, there was just not this conversation of, Hey, what are you doing to prepare other than are you, did you build the crib or did you build the dresser and the changing table? And yes, I did but I'm more than just this extra pair of hands, right? There's an emotional process that men go through that we don't ever really talk about. And, and many of my coworkers didn't have kids yet or my close friends didn't have kids. So that's fair that no one had that experience, but I made sure to do that when I found out my guy friends were going through this process and making sure that they had friends. And, and ultimately that kind of evolved into what Fathering Together became as a support system to help dads just do that, that mental checklist in a, in a supportive community that that we didn't just devolve into dad jokes and sarcasm but really being intentional to care and be compassionate for this crazy ride that we're about to go through um and and I, and I agree with Kevin as well I was not clinically depressed but there was a moment and I was telling Corden this yesterday and I wasn't sure if I was going to share but I'm just going to go for it um about a week into our daughter being born my wife and I were home. It was freezing outside. So we hadn't left the house. And my wife said, I just need to go away. I'm just going to go to Target. I just need to get out of the house and get a catch of breath. And we were breastfeeding and didn't have any extra milk or anything stored up. So she fed my daughter and then bolted. Five minutes in, my daughter starts crying and it's the hunger cry. And I'm just like, I don't know what to do. And, and it dawned on me in that moment, I had, I have nothing to give this child other than to hold her. And it was an extreme moment of anxiety and almost worthlessness as a father. Like, am all I'm here for is to hold her? Like she has physical needs that I'm not able to fulfill. And, and, you know, compounding with exhaustion and lack of sleep, all these different things, you know, I definitely was a moment of, of real depressive feelings that if I had had a community of support to say, this is normal, Brian, 
you're okay, you're gonna get through this. I wouldn't, it wouldn't have been so visceral to me. And I wouldn't have had to default to calling my wife right away and say, you have to come home. Sorry for your little adventure being cut short. Um, and so again, like how do we normalize these things across fathers is, is critical to our mission at Fathering Together in that respect. So I'll pause there. Yeah, I'd love to love to jump in and, and build off of that. I, I think the, um, uh, yeah, that sense of, yeah, am I doing a good job? Am I like, what should I be doing? How, how do I, what, what, what are my sort of responsibilities? And, and I think, you know, repeatedly talking about the ex exhaustion and, and, and all that is like, is, is merited because you, you really are thrown like right into it and, and it can be like so disorienting. So it, it feels like right away for me, like I, I, I didn't have my bearings uh, at the very beginning. And so, um, and on top of that, like my wife, um, she, she had a, an infection from the, uh, from, from the experience of our, the birth of our first child. And so like more than normal, she was like feeling very, very ill when we got home and we didn't know what it was. And so there was sort of naturally like jumping in and, and like, okay, let me, um, you know, handle this at, at this point, at, you know, in the middle of the night and, and doing things like that. Um, so I, I certainly like, I think there is certainly an initial shock. I think for me later on, um, as we started to find our routine, what, what happened was like, for me in my work, I kind of went into my old routine of before I had kids. And that was just like how I knew how to operate. And it took quite a while for me to realize, whoa, my life is very different now. I need to like really start to shift uh, my priorities and how I think about what my day-to-day -day looks like and and these new responsibilities which were hoisted upon me and I hadn't yet adjusted to uh, so that was something that was like a very gradual thing where it was like whoa why are things so bad and it's like oh because I haven't really changed to like really being a father and understanding what that means mm, that's that's it's huge brother you know I um I became a father at 18 after, after coming out of behavioral treatment facilities. And so it was, you know, 13 through 18 was right in those programs. And then 18, you know, four months out of graduation became a father. And, and you know, for me, fa being a father was a very important thing for me. Um, my, you know, I was adopted. So my children were the first biological people that I ever knew was my own seeds. You know, I met my, I met my biological family when I was 19, but being a father at 18. So it was my son's, um, just that large responsibility of how do I protect? How do I provide? I'm 18 years old. I don't really know much. Um, you know, she was still in high school at the time and it was just a lot to, uh, to overcome. Um, and I think, you know, that, Again, I, I know everybody's kind of saying we didn't have depression at the time, but I can definitely see my stages of, you know, that initial learning that you're pregnant and then making the decision, you know, how do we proceed forward? Um, I think a lot of that came was, you know, mostly at first it was just how to provide, you know, the provider of the family. How do I provide and protect for my children? And then it became about so much more than that when my child finally came and I'm holding my child on the 4th of July for the first time watching these fireworks. I'm enjoying my child and I'm realizing, well, what else do I have to give? I know what I want to be as a father. I know what lessons that I want to teach, but how do I do that? And, and you know, it's, it's great today to be able to have that support, but, you know, it didn't always look good being a young father. And so, to, you know, to kind of fast forward from there, I went into the military right after that. And so that added a very interesting dynamic to what my fatherhood looked like because I was gone often. I was training two weeks out of the month um, away from my children. When I am home, it's usually just the evening. So there's, you know, on a schedule like that, you get very little time with your child. Um, and I always felt like sometimes you have to make that sacrifice is because you provide and protect, it might mean that I get less time with my children, but I know that they're eating and that they're safe and that they're fed. But at the same time, that causes that, causes that conflict within myself 
And I want to be there. I want to be there to do more things, to, to not come home and hear about all the things that my child did. I would love to witness those things. Um, and so you kind of fast forward to, you know, my daughter is seven now. Um, and again, it was, so this is after my military experience. I'm, I'm understanding my PTSD. I'm understanding weight gain after coming home from Iraq. And, um, you know, to be a father really changed me. A father of a daughter changed me the most because as my boys, my boys are like, oh, my dad's this mean, tough soldier and I love it. And, you know, we talk about guns and all the cool stuff that boys talk about. <laughs> um, but with my daughter, it was a totally different stance um, because I had to look through her eyes and understand how soft I had to be. I couldn't be this rigid soldier anymore. It didn't work with her. So I had to learn how to talk about things and, and, and listen to her intently to hear exactly what she needs. And I think, you know, as I, as I got more into the role, I think my, my fatherhood has changed that I make more time today to be an intentional father. I base, you know, I, now I base my job around my, my fatherhood. I have my daughter four days a week and it's, it's the best, but there's a lot of work that has to be done and there's schedules that I have to mitigate that doesn't always work as a man. It doesn't work in the workplace. So if, you know, being grateful that the, you know, the flexibilities of a job that allow me to have childcare or, or to take time off from my child has been extremely crucial. So those things have been made it easier um, to top the, to top it, but still the struggle, you know? Yeah, I think, okay, there's so much that, there's so many questions that I have now from all of this. I think, um, a kind of the role you you're all girl dads and kind of would love to expand more on how has being the the dad of a daughter changed your perception of masculinity or what fatherhood means to you and kind of what has that impact like how have have you adjusted how have you thought about how the words or the things that you you say or do can you know impact them positively or negatively um would love to kind of hear if you if you have if you have thought about that at all yeah, absolutely. I'll take that one. Um, you know, I would say the number one thing, you know, just like I said, I had to look how I look, look at myself in my daughter's view. You know, I, I grew up in psychology, so I knew, you know, how to address my child. I knew to get on my knee to speak to my child instead of standing above them, right? To, to show that I'm listening and telling to their story. But I learned that it went further beyond that when I had my own struggles, you know, whether it was my mental health or my PTSD. Um, my daughter noticed, you know, my, I say my daughter because I'm around my daughter most. She notices those things. She notices when daddy's off. She notices when I'm emotional and she'll, she'll be very blatant. Are you okay, daddy? I mean, you can, you can wave that off a couple of times, but eventually they understand. And, you know, when they come and put their arms around you because they see something different, you know, I had to learn to express that. Mm. Um, and so being able to sit down and talk to my daughter whether that's using our little flip books that has the emojis on it that help us regulate what the feelings are, um, whether it's flashcards that show what the feelings are, or whether it's just the tapping that I do that shows my daughter how I de-stress through something has been absolutely crucial because now I've been able to see, I've been able to see by modeling and being able to see what she learns from it when I have a stressful moment, where I'm, I'm high in my emotions and I work through something. And she adopts that when she's stressed now. And I think I don't know the best path forward, but I think if I can model it a little bit more every day, then I feel like that makes a difference. Yeah, you know, I'm happy to um, add to this um, recording because I think my experience in a way has been, has been somewhat different um, but I think that it's nice to hear both both sides of it, you know. Um, so I have two daughters, but one of them is um, is gender nonconforming. Um, so having uh, I, I've actually I, I think in general, if we sort of roll back just be, what it means to be a man, being a man who is um, communicating feelings and being sensitive to people's minds, to our kids' minds. You know, it's um, it's something that we don't tend to learn much about as as boys. Um, 
know, and I, I'm, I'm always hesitant to say something about all cultures because I think that's so problematic, but I think in, in most cultures, at least in the United States, um, men are really taught to be um, strong and powerful and stoic and to be able to manage um, everything on their own. You know, and I think that really gets in the way of us building relationships that are deeper. You know, um, it creates a lot of loneliness. It creates a, a difficulty getting to know those that we love deeply, you know? And so um, I, in a way, I, I've always wondered, like, because so much of my work is with boys and, and men, um, if it might be harder actually to, um, to raise boys and to be sensitive to their own minds and their own feelings and their own, and to let them know that, um, that they don't have, that they can lean on others for support, you know? Um, and, and I also have two daughters who are so different. You know, I have one daughter who practically will take no support for you, but she's very gender conforming. And then I have another daughter who's quite gender non-conforming and is uh, very relationally oriented and wanting to talk about her feelings. And, um, and so it's, um, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a tough job, especially when we don't often have role models to like, you know, my father, for example, I, I've never really heard him talk about any feelings, but he's very warm and sensitive, but he doesn't know how to talk about his feelings. You know, there's um, in the clinical literature, we talk about alexithymia, or there's a, almost a normative alexithymia and that's for men. And that, that's a, um, an inability or real difficulty in understanding your feelings and communicating your feelings. And so that really can make parenting more difficult, you know? Um, so um, that's what I'd say about it. Yeah. Uh, I can jump in, and uh, unless you got something dying to say, Steven. Um, I think for me, I, I struggle with girl dad as a term just because, again, it's like this gender conforming language, even though you know, I celebrate being a dad with daughters. Um, but for me, part of this comes with the idea of like, how do you role model good behavior to your kids? And it's not how you directly treat your children, even though that's critical, but it's, it's how, what's your relationship with their mother, um, with other women around you. I grew up with a dad who was very respectful and very caring and, and very, you know, communicative with me about his emotions because my grandfather was like, the Marlboro man in so many ways and both in smoking and how he dressed. I mean, my first gift from him was one of those Bolero ties. And um, I have no memory of my grandfather ever emoting anything to me, let alone my dad. And, um, but it wasn't so much that he was expressive with me as much as I saw how much he adored my mother, adored my sister, respected other women and elevated them in our church community and in, in other positions. And even though he didn't really like his supervisor at work, who was a woman, he always made sure to, to, to delineate, it's not her as a woman I don't like, it's the way that the, my office is run or something about it, right? He was just very clear to name that the relationship and the role models that he had was placing before me was, was one that I needed to emulate. And so with my daughters, I'm constantly aware of, if if my wife and I are going to have a blowout fight, which we sometimes do, like we make sure that if the girls hear it, how, explaining what happens, but still having like a hug and a kiss at the end, or if, if we're really upset with the girls about something, we always end it with a, but I still love you. You're not a bad person. It's the act that you did. And, and then putting myself in timeout or expressing that I have regret for the feelings I have or the actions that I've done if I lost my temper or, you know, broke something, whatever I did, really emulating and role modeling what I want them to pick up instead of going on a date with them, like, and, and treating them like a princess. Like, I want them to feel like a princess if they want, but I also want them to have a doctoral degree and an Olympic, you know, training course on the side, like allowing them to be as well-rounded as possible and no pressure on the goals for the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'll pause there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely, that, that sort of well-rounded 
piece I can relate to and, and something that, uh, that there's sort of two sides in terms of my daughters. On one hand, we will like do sort of individual father-daughter dates and go out and uh, have them be sort of comfortable and familiar with what a sort of positive um, sort of male experience is like. Um, and then on the other side of it, it's like uh, understanding again with sort of like gender stereotypes and expectations and how we were raised uh, this idea of like, what are things that maybe they're not getting typically exposed to that are more male uh, sort of oriented and how can that not be like limited in their experience? And so like, I'm a big, I'm a big nerd. I play this role-playing game, Magic the Gathering. And I taught my daughters how to play and we'll play. And my wife said, you're turning our precious daughters into big nerds. And I'm like, yes, I am. And they enjoy it. And, and, uh, and we'll do things like uh, have Nerf gun fights and, and things again, that would like typically be sort of like more like male interests, um, but just wanting to make sure that they have like as full a breadth of experience as possible. Steven, I need to ask you about this after because I play Magic the Gathering with some kids in my practice and they stack their decks, these punks, you know, and they just kill me. So I gotta, I, I'm gonna ask you how to actually give them a better, a better game, you know. You, you need the same cards, the same cards, everybody, same cards. Yeah. yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I love the idea of, st I, I would, I, I'm like one of those people who can't lose to children either. So uh, I get it, you know, I'm just too competitive. <laughs> uh, but I think that that all of what you've said is, I love the approach that, you know, like it shouldn't be girl dad, it should be just emulating really good behavior and really helping people understand that emotions are okay, no matter who you are. But I love the tapping. I love the kind of different tools you can give children to think about, like, how do I process this emotion that I'm feeling? How do I name that? How do I put words to describe what this is? And I think the point that it might be harder to have sons is really uh, just such a good thing to hear, because I think there's a lot of anger right now towards men. Um, you know, I think it's, it's, it is something, and I think we really, what I was so excited about this panel is I think we need to give men the tools and space to learn how to process emotions, which is something that it, it just felt like they haven't really had. Um, another theme that you've all touched upon a lot is the kind of community that you either formed or needed when you became a parent. And I'd love to kind of hear, maybe even Kevin, from, from your kind of clinical perspective, how, how many dads do you think are struggling without that kind of community? And what, what role does community really, you know, how important is that? And where would you rank that on the, the tools to give yourself when you become a parent? Yeah, um, so, you know, about 10% of new parents our new fathers are have mental health challenges as a result of um, becoming a father, you know, which is comparable to what, what we, um, it's comparable to postpartum depression. You know, um, you know I, I'm, as a psych, I'm sort of a wannabe statistician, you know, because I actually like seem to skip over that in graduate school, which is a real problem. Um, but, but if, just so you can put this in perspective, like what 10% is like worldwide, you know, we have about 7.8 billion people in the world. I'm sure there's someone here in the stand, in the audience, in the stands, you know, um, that probably might have some questions about my numbers, but I think you'll, you'll, it'll become clear. Um, so that's about, about 50% of, you know, people on earth are men you know, which is about 3.9 billion, you know, and about 70 to 80, 75 to 80 percent of men become fathers in their, in their lives. Um, so that's about like 10 percent of that having mental health challenges is about 
uh, 312 million people on earth right now will have experienced the perinatal mood and anxiety disorder in their life. Um, so we're actually talking about a pretty big um, public health um, crisis, you know? Um, and, and the studies that say that it's about 10% are really studies that have been conducted internationally. Um, and so one of the challenges is, is that really there are not programs designed to support new fathers in, in their mental health, for having mental health issues, for parenting, for their parenting support, or even really to um, help either to build on the great things that fathers are capable of doing, which is, I think, like has been touched upon by everyone here, you know, that it really develops uh, kids' ability to um, develop self-confidence, to build relationships, to, um, to move through difficult situations in their life, to develop social emotional skills, and all of these things that dads are quite capable of doing and quite successful at doing when they're involved, you know? Um, so, so this is really, a, from my perspective, a huge issue. I mean, programs like, like Brian's program of Fathering Together is this incredible way, I'm, I'm sure he'll talk about it, like of bringing, bringing fathers together. We also need, um, there are so many syst systemic barriers that um, make it so that men aren't really a part of the kind of mental health conversation about the parenting conversation. And that, and I would say that really affects families. Um, one thing when you really get it into learning about uh, perinatal mental health with both for, for women and for, for fathers, um, for mothers and for fathers is that really these, these disorders affect whole families. So when moms are depressed, dad's rates of depression go up to 25 to 50%. So to really be treating a mother for postpartum depression, you almost have to be thinking about a father. You know, when a, when a mother has perinatal depression, the child's risk of depression and mental health challenges also goes up about six times or four to six times or something. You know, the same is true with dads. When dads are depressed, it puts a strain on, on, uh, on moms they're more likely to be depressed. Children are more, I mean, like, so it's, these are really family disorders. Um, and I think to have a conversation about perinatal mental health, we really need to be thinking about individuals and about families, um, which we don't do really. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. Cause I don't, this is like, I could talk about this all day, but um, I'm sure someone else has something more, even more valuable to say than what I just said. Just because you named me, Kevin, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I think the biggest thing to get around this is to normalize it too, right? In, in the sense of um, how are we making it okay for men to say, hey, I'm having a rough day, I could use some support. And in our communities then, um, you know, we have 125,000-ish active members in our Dads with Daughters Facebook community. Um, and there's plenty of other dad communities that exist. So we're not the only one, but we have many people join our group and say, I, there was this toxic group or this group that was all about very sarcastic and, and memes that were hurtful. And this is so special, like why? And it is because we put these parameters of you have to like, we don't want jokes to mask the pain. We don't want, um, us to kind of simplify things with a meme. We really want to help dads process these emotions and allow for people to make comments that aren't just trolled immediately, but instead opening an avenue for deeper healing, deeper connectivity. And 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 to to Kevin's point, it is a it's a family issue. And and again, if if we are not role modeling healthy behavior with the co-parent, that's going to get picked up on. Um, when I when I have meltdown after meltdown after a really stressful day, if I if I don't have a healthy mechanism to prevent my escalation, the girls are going to learn that it's okay just to escalate. And my eldest has more anxiety issues because of that. And every time I see her escalate, I'm like, this is me. This is me being role modeled back to me because that's how I handled this situation the other day. Or, 
or the best was when my four-year-old said, daddy, are you going to say, damn it? Because you look angry. <laughs> and, and, and I was just like, how do I explain that we shouldn't say those words, even though that comes out of my mouth every other hour sometimes. And so again, it's, it's normalizing that it's okay to talk about it and, and having a space that is a, a dad only space so that there's not that like fear of judgment from, from others is, is critical too. So I'll, I'll pause there because I know Courtney and Steve has stuff to say. Can I just add, I'm going to add one thing. I'm going to jump in just, I'm, I'm sorry, because I think if we talk about um, paternal mental health challenges, Brian, you're making me think of something as you sort of, you know, say damn it and your child sort of says that too, or um, is, is that um, when we think about mental health challenges for men and we think about depression, um, it, it often it looks different in men than it does in women, which is something that is really um, difficult for, I think, even people in my field to even wrap their minds around. And I think just, so it's often missed. So it's no, it's no surprise to me that we all felt like we didn't have depression or anxiety, even though that like, it gets pretty likely when you have like four men that maybe one would have it, you know? Um, but so we, we see a lot of irritability. You know, we see a lot of externalizing of, of feelings. So it, because we're often not taught to um, share our vulnerable feelings, our sadness, our, our loss, our grief, um, our, our, our fear, what we end up doing is acting it out. You know, so you see more substance abuse or you start drinking more. Um, you know, so it's a lot, a lot of the things that we think about, about being men or how men are being jerks or assholes, you know, you know, sometimes it's, I mean, you can be both a jerk and an asshole and also having the struggling, you know, which I think is probably a good way to sort of think about it. Um, but that's helpful for me, at least in thinking about these mental health issues. Okay. So. Cool. Um, I think, thank you both for, for that, for the, like, just kind of flushing that out a bit. I think it's really, it's important to think about like as a partnership too with parenting, you know, like, it, you know, if, if, if one of you is feeling a certain way, then the other one is probably going to be receiving some of that anxiety or, or, sad, or, you know, depression. And how do you, how do you work with, the, you know, whatever your family might look like, maybe it's not a partner, maybe it's, um, family members or your kind of village that you've created, but just being aware enough to know that it's probably, it might not just be you on your own. Um, and, and kind of would love to, you know, hold on, actually you're getting some good questions. Um, how can a dad bring this up to their partner or to the other people who are part of their, their, their parenting family? Um, and also how, like, what, what are the biggest things to kind of recognize in yourself that, might be like, oh, that is, that could, that is depression or that is anxiety. You know, I think a lot of us who might not have access to mental health or a lot of education in that space might not even know how to recognize what it is that we're feeling. So what are kind of the biggest flags or the, you know, and how would you then communicate that out to your partner or your, whoever else you're, you're raising your family with? I'm happy to jump in again. I mean, it's like, um, you know, I, I I think about it in 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 a few ways. Like, one, I think this is is this is really uh, in part on um, systems of care, on um, you know prenatal, antenatal, you know, in the UK services, on um, seeing your OBGYN, having health visitors and home visitors really thinking about um, dad's mental health, but the, potential, the potentiality of a father having mental health or parenting challenges. So I think it, it needs to also, we need to have a system that reflects that, you know? Um, and, and I think it, and, and when we have a system that reflects that dads can be vulnerable to these things, then we can really think about, um, and we can support them from, from the get-go. Um, it is a really hard conversation to have, um, you know, with a new mom who's struggling to, for a dad to say they're also struggling. 
I guess the, the challenge with that though, if, if when men are not really open about their feelings, what they end up doing is they act them out. And so then we have a sort of bigger problem, you know, in a family when dads are withdrawn, you know, or dads are um, drinking too much, um, or dads are having an affair because they can't tolerate the, the loss that's sort of taken place in having a baby, you know. So I think like for me, one of the, the big signs in thinking about um, like what can you, what can fathers recognize about, about their feeling like they might be struggling, I think about feeling disconnected, feeling lonely, feeling like, um, you know, that you're, you're, you don't have access to the people you love. Because mm. um, mental health challenges are really uh, issues around just feeling disconnected, feeling isolated. Lack of identity. Yeah, uh, Corden, why don't you jump in? Yeah. <laughs> Brian. Um, yeah, I'll go. I'll go, Brian, and then I'll, I'll tag off. Actually, here I'll I'll, I'll <laughs> jump in. Yeah, Steve. Yeah. Um, yeah. My my wife is a licensed clinical social worker, and something that she's talked about, uh, sort of both you know her experience and and just. Um, as a as a therapist and in in just families, and that when you go from having uh, just like let's say, you know, a husband and a wife, uh, a, a mother and a father, and uh, and then you you add in a child, it goes from this like one to one relationship to now you have a triangle, where you still have that relationship, but now you each have a relationship with the child, and it can, and, and not realizing that you are now in a triangle. And Kevin, what I kind of hear from you is like, oh, the, the father, let's say, sees mother interacting with child and feels like out of the loop entirely there. And that can lead to isolation. Where do I fit? And, you know, Brian, your example earlier, when your wife went to Target, right? It's like, okay, wait a minute. Now I have this here, but like, what do I do? And I can't, you know, provide the same things that a mother could provide. So I think like that, that was helpful for me in terms of like understanding, oh yes, it's important to maintain and build relationships between father and child directly. And then also to maintain the relationship with the, with the mother, but it becomes so hard again, when, when you're really thrust into this position, you're just like, whoa, how do I keep this child alive? Like, how do we get through this, fight through the exhaustion, et cetera? And so understanding like that dynamic to me has been helpful and like, especially thinking ahead, like, oh, these kids are gonna move out. And then how, how you know, we're gonna go from, I don't know if that's a hexagon with three kids, but like <laughs> back to just this one-on-one -on -one relationship when the kids move out, right? Like how have I been doing to support them? And then also, I guess, to support myself, my self-care uh, as a sort of node in that, in that system. Absolutely, man. I, I think that, you know, I just want to go off the, the self-care thing. You know, I think that's in, important that both have their spaces to have that self-care. You know, as the, you know, the wife stressed, the husband stressed, or you're just part of that triad, just being able to get away and have that balance. And I think sometimes we do see the extreme of a man going out and doing whatever he's doing, or 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 even just the extreme that they're doing things separately, right? And I think you know we talk about different things like date night, being able to bring those things up, or maybe relationship games or cards. Um, to be able to talk about those things, because again, you know, I think the critical thing is that we're still a unit at that point. And even though we're in that triad and we have different relationships, is that separation that we keep saying over and over, which is the problem, is that that separation. So in somebody like me that has like a reactive attachment, separate separation is very easy for me to do. So I am hyper aware that that if you have even a small issue, I can disconnect myself very easily and go do my self-care, right? I, I can probably self-care on the unhealthy side of things um, <laughs> when it comes to that, right? So mine might be going to the gym a little too much. Maybe I'm spending, you know, twice a day instead of doing this or this with my kid. Um, so, you know, I have to be aware of those things. Um, and, I, you know, I, I do realize that 
I hear a lot of fathers saying, we talk to each other, right? I think Brian was kind of saying, you know, most times it's usually a joke about the stressors that we have in our lives. And it's played off as that. And that's kind of the conversation just kind of stops there. Um, you know, and it kind of reminds me of the military. We have this phrase called embrace the suck, right? The thing, sometimes things suck sometimes. You just got to embrace it. And I feel like men together, we have that strength, that unity. We know the other person's going through it too. So it's kind of just throwing it out there. And then it's kind of like, well, I'll be fine. And we know that we can, we can, we all know that we can find things to death. Um, and so I, I think it is crucial um, in those moments where I have a friend and I can say, hey, you know, I see that you're really stressed. You want to, you want to unpack that, you know, it's, it's something with your kid that's going on. It's something with your wife, just being able to be that sounding board for them, that little voice of reason um, and, and I think it's it's crucial to be able to understand how they advocate for themselves in that moment. Um, you know, I think I think some of the signs sometimes are self betrayal. You know, we talk about self love, but what about self betrayal? You know, I think I've seen that as you know my partner setting a goal on something. You know, whether that's a health goal, it's I would say especially with my partner it was always like a health goal. Let me try this new diet or this new patch. Um, and just never, never finishing that goal that they set forth, um, and so it's the opposite side of self love. It's self betrayal because they're not, they're not having that cruise for themselves to do it for themselves. And I think that's like a key indicator that you're not yourself and that you do need help from your from your partner or from the from the triad. You know, I'll I'll just answer this from a slightly different perspective because I agree with everything that was said, but. Um... You know, studies are also very clear, like women do a lot of the unpaid labor at home and, and a lot of the home management is the mom's domain, traditionally, stereotypically. And, and I would also often feel regret of like, I can't share my emotions, my stresses, because that's just adding to my wife's plate. And, and to some extent, there's some truth to that if, if I'm not pulling my weight. And so how do we then couple the the caregiving and the care planning that comes with a healthy functional home and we're not always in that space especially in COVID we've all been tested but how do I pick up slack and contribute in ways that I can to open the door for me to be able to talk about my struggle and and there's another question about like how do we know if it's really depression versus feeling emotional and I think by talking it out with my partner, but also with other guy friends to say like, hey, I don't know what I'm feeling right now. I need to do an emotional self check-in, but I also need to bounce this off someone allows for a sense of normalcy and a normative experience. Um, I mean, coming from you know a ministry background, we often talk about, is it, real, is it God that you're talking to or just your own ego? And through prayer and through conversation, you can kind of suss that out. But it's the same is true in your community, right? Like, am I really being emotional and over oversensitive, or is this something that I'm slipping into something clinical? And if you aren't emoting that in a way that is communicated and, and then discussing that with your partner or your, your other dad friends to do a self-check-in, then it is really hard to know. Um, mm -hmm. and, and to Kevin's point earlier, my depression doesn't come up, show up as sadness or or being lethargic or not wanting to care about things. It comes up as anger and frustration. And, and I know when I'm getting irritable, it's because I'm not fueling a part of myself that needs to be at attended to. And whether that's in my career ambitions or being able to be the best dad that I can be, I know that when I'm not hitting my full cylinders, I, it's gonna show up as frustration and anger. And, and I don't like that about myself. It's something I'm always constantly doing self check-ins or, or getting, you know, a late night call with Corden on the, on the agenda to, to hash it out. But, um, but if there's not, if that, there's not that open conversation and a normalizing of the process as a family unit, then, then it, it's just that much harder to get it started in the first place. Absolutely. And Brian, if I can just tag on to that, and I'm sure Kevin can verify, you know, I, I, I think I learned long ago, like, there's, there's the emotion of having, I'm going through something, but if you're feeling that over extended period of time, 
that's when you know something's truly going on, right? It's not just, you know, I had I had a bad interaction with my daughter and I'm feeling some type of way. It's it's a it's a consistent feeling that you're, you know, whether it's a nagging or you're just very sure that you're feeling off about yourself, that there's something that you're not getting fulfilled. So I think it's again, I guess just to summarize that, it's that long, it's a longer term feeling. I think it's crucial to pay attention to. And we talked about normalizing. Men need to see themselves normalized as well. I think part of that is just the feelings of being able to talk to somebody and knowing those people that you talk to should be able to kind of, hey, it's been a month and you've been talking about this, but you've been talking about this for a while and I see it's really on your chest. What are you doing about that? Are you talking to your partner about it? So just, you know, those check-ins with the normal people you have in your circle are extremely important. Yeah, I think, thank you all that, yeah, I think it's, it is the, again, it's just like the, the tools to know that an emotional check-in is such a, just like to take that space for yourself and say, okay, yeah, what is, what is this feeling that I'm sitting with? And, you know, is that a long-term thing? Has it been going on for a while? Have I not noticed it? Is it because work is super stressful, like these past couple of weeks, you know, I think identifying um, is, is so important and it, I think it's probably one of the best things that bounce it, like, like Brian said, you know, bouncing that off of someone, like, is it, is it, am I being oversensitive? Is it my ego? Like what, just kind of having that sounding board and that community that we've, we've spoken about already um, to really question or to like kind of have that. Um, you know, I think you've, you've all, you've mentioned COVID, you're all entrepreneurs and founders. Um, you know, I think this year's probably been exponentially more stressful in some ways. You're also parents who probably lost childcare to some degree at, at some point in the last year. Um, what would you say your best resources and other tools or tricks that you have um, just for you know other dads listening who might not feel comfortable talking about their feelings yet? What, what are other things that people can do you know, just to help mediate some of the stress or the feelings that they have? And if you really want to drive home that it's talk to someone, I'm all about that. And I'll, you know, I'll drive that home, talk to someone, but what are, what are some other things that are other resources or ways that people might be able to kind of find that mental health? Yeah. I just, I, I'll just jump in with a quick one. Um, and I pulled it here. I've got this, uh, Steve's, Oh, Steve, it's my background's messing it up. It says, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, there we go. Steve's self-care. And it says like, sleep seven, eight hours, exercise, go on walks, bike rides, lift weights, eating, eat vegetables and fruits and greens, connection with my wife, my kids, my friends, my family, do things I enjoy, like watch movies and TV, listen to music, and in the back, meditation, create videos, photography, play, cards, video games, board games, sports, cook, go on adventures. So it's like, uh, this was something that uh, I, needed to sort of like share with my wife and kind of like say hey uh what is your self-care need to be uh here's what mine looks like and she said hey let's let's actually let's do this with the kids let's 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 role model to them what uh because like i, I didn't grow up like thinking about self-care or like what that even was i'm still just trying to like wrap my head around it and I keep it in a place so I remember to do these things. And, and then so bringing the kids into that uh, conversation as well was like an, an, an opportunity to, to, you know, again, role model um, and, then, and then show how, how important that is. Um, yeah. I think you said all the options, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I can just, I guess I can just continue to echo that really is the, the self-care is huge knowing what, um, you know, kind of getting back to the things that make me happy and knowing what those things look like and what, you know, how available I am to those and being able to express that I, whether I need to go on a Saturday and go to a hotel and sleep for four hours because the house is pretty nor uh, crazy. Um, it might be something simple as that or, you know, getting out with my kids, but it's definitely crucial to be able to communicate what your expectations are. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's, I think I just have to remind dads how creative we are, right? And, and when it comes to your healing, it's no different. 
You can be creative with your healing. There's certain things that you love to do that you just need to go and do. And whatever that looks like for you, find your little bit of solace to do that and be creative in it and enjoy yourself with it. Yeah, if I, if I could add, because I was, Steve, I was really um, impressed by your list actually, because in a few few months ago, I do a lot of work, you know, around training people or around working with fathers um, and try, I try to, and they're mainly women, and I try to talk to them about um, masculinity. And, um, and, and there was a time when I, I realized like, so everything on my self care list was about um, stuff that was isolated. You know, it was about exercise, it was about doing things on my own. And, and, um, and what for me, what really stuck out, and, and I think that has something to do with masculinity and feeling like you can self care is about really just um, you, you can manage it on your own by, you know, having a run or a bike ride or um, which those are, are important. But Steve really hit it, I think, when he said, you know, to take time for connection, you know, and, um, you know, I think talking is a good way to connect. <laughs> So, so now I think really like talking is talking it out as, as, as a psychologist, you know, to mm. talk about, but, but I think even, but the reason for that is, is, is because talking is one way that we can feel connected to others. You know, one of the things about when we struggle, we're so isolated, you know, we're so alone. I think things to break down that ability to feel less alone, especially for dads. Because men, I, you know, maybe contrary to what we would imagine, there's a lot of research on, on men and loneliness. And men tend to be more lonely than women when you look at kind of broad spectrum kind of the research, you know. Um, so that's really important. Time with your own, with your child alone. Mm. Time with your baby alone, where you really can build that relationship is so important, you know. To be able to find ways that you know you, that you can do it, um, you know that uh, you don't need someone else there to be able to have a connection with your baby, to change their your their diaper, or to to feed wh whatever it is, you know, um, it's really important. Uh, and then time, if if you're in a relationship, time with your partner, alone. Um, and if and you know, yeah, that's what I would say. Uh, but Steve, I appreciate your list and. It's like really um, something that I will go back to. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, uh, real quick. So Stephen, um, the emoji book that I was mentioning earlier, I have for my daughter, it has like a, you know, a beautiful face. And then you flip that over and on the uh, backside, it says like five things you can do when you're feeling that emotion. Mm -hmm. um, so that's exactly what that reminded me of. Amazing job. Um, and so I, I think just to add on, I, I have to echo my ability is self-help books. Being able to go to the store and get a book and I can read it and walk through it. It's got a little worksheet in it that helps me do these things. I think it just takes a commitment once you get the book to just do it, um, whether you're finding it in there. Um, another option that I that it works for me is affirmation cards. Um, they're called divination or oracle cards. Um, a simple one is like, um, I have one that's numerology, it's just numbers and it might, there's 52 cards and one of them might say spirituality or leadership or knowledge. And it's so, you know, dipping a card like that, it can be, say if it says spirituality, I can figure out ways in my day to be more conscientious of my spirituality just because I pulled that card. Because because nine times out of ten we are in a routine. We are all in a routine, especially as a triad. You know, you're out the house at this time. You're out the house at this time. We're picking the kids up at this time. But about to take that moment and have a different thought process, just because you pulled a card, carries me through the day. And then being able to have a mantra throughout the rest of the day when I do feel that stress, being able to have a mantra such as "I am worthy," or creating an "I am" statement that talks about how I am human. I am a man. I'm a black man, however that looks like for you. But just know, you know, those things have helped me solidify who I am when I am, you know, in my peace, in my core. Equanimity is being able to find peace amidst chaos. 
right? So being able to know what your I am statement is and who you are in that moment is, is, is paramount. Um, I got nothing to add because we're <laughs> short on time. I mean, I've got lots to add, but I, I think just to also name, I saw your comment, Steve. I, I was very extroverted as a younger person. As I get older, I'm more introverted. And in the evening hours, sometimes I just need to be alone. Um, and it's, I think it's also critical that we're all in the United States and coming from a Western culture. And there's other ways of being. There's other ways of connection. But ultimately, as humans, we're still social creatures. And we, we are not meant to be isolated. And while you might need some quiet time to be alone with God or yourself or whatever you need to, you have to balance that with, with the social. And I, I just really underscore everything that everybody else said. So I'll just leave it at that for brevity's sake. Um, yeah, wow. That was, that was an incredible response, that answer to that question. So human connection, talking to someone, the visualization of of it, of it being a word or a list and just that, like that visual reminder, I think is really nice and a really good takeaway as well. And then those affirm, the affirmative statements um, are all such great tools. So thank you all so much for sharing that. And thank you for an incredible hour. Um, I think Saran has been crying the whole time. Uh, she messaged me on the side and we are so like, so grateful for, for all of your input. Um, we'll be posting this on YouTube after. Um, and sharing out multiple cl uh, clips and everything. Um, but we'll also share all of your information and how people can find all of your different organizations um, by email and uh, on all of our socials. So unless you have any last uh, thoughts or, or statements, um, well, we can wrap here, but have a great weekend, a great Friday, and thank you again. Mm -hmm.